please subscribe and hit the like button. Well, good evening. Welcome to Yadi Radio. Happy Shabbat to one and all. We have both uh, JB and Kirk uh, here, and we have an unusual occurrence. We have uh, me wanting just to jump back into uh, Barber Sheath 29, and Kirk has told me that he wants to go over some uh, some COVID news. So, Kirk, the floor is yours. Okay. Well, y'all jump in or whatever you think, but okay. um, I had three three disturbing things that happened uh, that I looked up this week uh, recently mm-hmm. in the last couple of days. And we'll start with COVID. Uh, it's, it, and this something doesn't make sense here. The uh, the well, first of all, um, let me throw in a caveat first. There's uh, the New York Bar, Bar Association are, are pushing hard for a um, absolutely no exemplary, no exemption, mandatory vaccinations. Uh, for COVID, um, that, that's that's um, we don't know where they work. We don't know who's making them. There's no test on them. Uh, um, yeah, they're going to make them. They're, gonna, they're trying desperately to make it. Uh, uh, Can you imagine mandatory. how that's going to respond? How that's going to affect the 40 percent of people in this country who embrace conspiracies and high in the conspiracies are vaccines. And the highest mm-hmm. in that conspiracy is that the government has uh, concocted the COVID-19 scare specifically because they want to vaccinate, vaccinate us. And that vaccine will be a control mechanism uh, for humankind. Now, mind you, there is zero percent chance that any of that is true. But nonetheless, you have 40 percent of Americans that believe that's true. And if the government were to say, we are going to mandate the vaccine. It's the dumbest thing mm-hmm. they could possibly do. That, that's just like saying the government's going to mandate people uh, not being able to work and mandate that they have to stay home. Oh, they did that, didn't they? Uh, yeah, so they're capable of, uh, of being stupid. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it, listen, well, I, uh, I actually I look think at it. that the likelihood of a, of a vaccine working is not the 90 percent that um, is being touted, uh, a fraction of that, because, first of all, uh, you have to get north of 70 people, 70 percent of the people to take. it. Otherwise, you know, it's still going to spread. Uh, number two, the vaccine has to create the necessary antibodies, which means the vaccine can't the virus can't mutate very much or the vaccine won't be effective. Number three, you have to give everyone two shots of this vaccine, and the logistics of that for 8 million people around the world is essentially impossible. You, you can't even distribute mm-hmm. it around the world. Uh, and then you, you have the, uh, the problem of we have no clue as to whether or not this, uh, the antibodies will have any longevity. And so you've got all of that uh, going against this. Uh, and you also have a virus that is a little bit uh, HIV, uh, a little bit Ebola, a little bit uh, standard uh, Corona. Um, uh, you know, I think you're less likely to have a, an effective vaccine for this than we do for the flu. And the flu is a hit and miss thing. You know, it's every year. Yeah, you, mm-hmm. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't work. And yeah. so I... I I'm just not optimistic. I, I don't think that uh, that the salvation is uh, in an imminent uh, vaccine long term, uh, probably, but certainly not in the short term. Hey, you do live in the land of uh, of COVID. Crazy. Though. I understand that you uh, now have a million cases in the People's Republic of uh, California. Well, uh, let me address worldwide, and, and then you tell me okay. whether we have a million cases Please. that are deadly. The, here are the real numbers that I can find. Is um, They told us that we would have about 20 million people die from this. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Cases are about 1.5 worldwide. Um, we've got about 2.5 million. Even if they doubled, it would still be inconsequential. Uh-huh. Uh, I found out cardiovascular disease kills uh, 15 million a year. Uh-huh. Um, and if you call, if you look at all causes of mortality uh, in the country, we have about 60 million on a regular mm-hmm. basis. So that makes it um, everything else about 125 times larger than uh, the uh, COVID. Mm-hmm. 
they had to Correct. shut the whole world down for coffee. Uh, yes. The, um, <laughs> yeah. Annual. So, so if you had an annual death around the world of for people, let's see. If you have the most, I looked at the populist group because now I'm really approaching 70. Uh, mm-hmm. According to that, even if 4.5 million of us, of those of us who are at 70 or close close to it or mm-hmm. past it, were to die, it would still be less than 1%. Mm-hmm. So you and you would have to uh, to have it reduce, have the odds be even higher. Um, than one percent, and we're talking minuscule to even get to one percent. You'd have to kill at least four point five million, and it's just not happening. No. The point this bothers me so much is you shut down the whole. They shut down the whole country, and so many jobs and so many people. And the world. Just uh-huh. yeah, and the world, and just for this, what 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 are people to do? And and you can't right. get out. You can't go anywhere. It's just horrible. Yeah, my view has always been the same, and it was the same the first week that we learned about COVID and and people talking about shutdowns, is that the damage we're going to do to the economy in the United States and worldwide would um, harm and kill far more people than the disease, and Mm -hmm. that the number of people that would die and be severely affected by the lockdowns would be in the range of five to 10 times greater than the disease because Mm -hmm. suicides would go up, alcohol abuse would go up, uh, domestic abuse would go up, child abuse would would go up. uh, And man just does not function well, uh, deprived of, uh, of social outlet. So we are seeing huge increases in suicide and in drug abuse and alcoholism and uh, uh, the like and um, and um, uh, domestic abuse, and that we are seeing, in fact, that the death toll from those things is greater than the COVID death toll, and it didn't need to be the case. And we also know that uh, that the people worldwide who are going to die because of the shutdown of economies and the fact that liberals not only hate business, they've got no concept of business, uh, that that too is going to end up killing far more people. I had a friend, we were having dinner the other night, and he was talking about uh, um, Obama's uh, economic uh, plan for China and how Trump uh, claimed credit for it. And I said, are you absolutely out of your mind? And Obama <laughs> never even asked if somebody wants fries with that hamburger. I mean, he never worked for a fast food restaurant, much less in a business. He, he was an absolute nincompoop economically. And you want to give him credit? Oh, he, you know, he surrounded uh, China. No, he didn't. He, he uh, sent our warships out against uh, China, which was unbelievably stupid. But he did nothing to endear himself or America uh, to pressure uh, Japan and North, and South Korea and the Philippines and other surround Russia particularly they hated him to oppose uh, China. Well, you can't talk about free enterprise uh, in China. Look at their control over the uh, internet. So, have you got any concept of the difference between government and economy? You know the economics of China are free enterprise. Look at the enterprise zones. The government is communist. The more liberal a country is. The the more uh, abusive it is of its people. That's why they constrain access to information in China. But there's a vast difference between the government, which is very liberal, and the economics and the enterprise zones, which is free enterprise. This is a this is a bright man, and he had no concept whatsoever. I mean, you could not even discuss the subject. So uh, it's true that the consequence of the lockdowns and the consequence of the deprivation of livelihoods and the response to COVID was far more catastrophic uh, than the disease itself. And neither of those things were appropriate responses to the disease. And even though we now even have the World Health Organization admitting that the lockdowns were counterproductive because of the increase of all manner of uh, of uh, negative implications. You still have countries that, in places in the United States that are locking 
uh, people down and depriving them of their livelihoods. And look at what California has, has done here recently. Well, they're, they're doing it this week. They're doing it this week yeah. in Sacramento County. Yeah. Again, they're, uh, they're shutting everything back down. It's like, um, oh, where do these people go? I mean, you right. can't. Right. And when the most recent <laughs> death and the mortality numbers are, are just essentially non existent. I mean, it's. Uh, we're back to flu numbers in terms of mortality. Yeah. Uh, so I, you, well, if you kick out, you know, I, you I'm out sorry. People disease. people die. Are there people dying of COVID? Yes. There's people dying of heart disease. There's people dying of diabetes. There's people uh, dying of pulmonary disease. There's people dying of drug overdoses. People dying of ac- people die. You know, um, if people I mean, didn't die, we would have a population of 100 billion people, and, and they would all be starving to death. I'm sorry. Well, let me give let People me give die. let me give you a scary number then. Let me give you another scary number. Annual death toll in the world is 59.5 million per year. We have mm-hmm. 7.8 billion people. Yeah. That's, that's a growing growing number. Yes. So um, you know so yes. but it Popul- ain't population is growing faster than it's dying. More people yeah. are being born than are uh, are dying each year. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm sorry. Man cannot prolong uh, life indefinitely. We all die. And, you know, unfortunately, in today's world where we hyper-focus on very narrow things and take them out of context, we have this fear porn over uh, over COVID. And to a large degree, I think that uh, Biden beat Trump because people don't understand the nature of uh, of this virus and how foolish our response was to it. But um, it, it turned out to be exactly as we uh, forecast when we began talking about it back in March is uh, mm-hmm. when we came to these conclusions and nothing has changed. Yeah. Let me yeah. share one other thing with you. Um, and mm-hmm. y'all give me your, uh, and JB also, uh, even though you're not a Californian, you you live out in the western part, or at least the mid Texas. western part of the United yeah. States, Texas in that other country, uh, but they came out with a report on what are we going to do about the fires because they're all projecting that we're going to have worse and worse uh, the mm-hmm. next few years. And yeah. here was what they came up with. They said, uh, yeah, they said, we'll go through all the forests and we'll cut down all the dead trees. Well, somebody said, well, how much would that cost? And they, and they gave so many numbers and they gave their numbers in so many billions that they said, okay, we can't do that. That's ridiculous. So they said, what we'll have to do is we'll have to take all the houses that live close and butt up against the wilderness. We'll have to make them out of fire retardant materials. Well, and then they have to clear all the land around them. Mm -hmm. Well, who's going to pay for that? Are you going Mm -hmm. to make it mandatory for them to do it? And they can't can't do it retroactively. Mm -hmm. And then they said, oh, oh, and on top of that, on top of that, um, most – and we're talking 99 percentile of all of the fires, other than a very small number that have started with um, lightning strikes. Most mm-hmm. of them, they agree, are man-made, not because they're power maniacs, but they're mm-hmm. man-made because man is butted up against the wilderness and is right. careless. And then we have the yeah. electric companies like PG&E that are just uh, devastating because when those power lines fall down, they spark and then it's Right. And it's just, uh, and there's just too many people in California now living out in the wilderness. Mm-hmm. There's just no way to stop. Nobody's going to come to your rescue out there. And we right. suffered probably a couple of years ago. Remember when the fires, and you were asking me about the fires, and I said, well, we're getting some smell. And then I told you the next time that I actually, uh, Terry went out, and that was before Terry went to the hospital, we, we went out, she went out and got some. Um, uh, N95 uh, mask, mm-hmm. and we mm-hmm. were really wearing them because it was it was bad. But that only took about two weeks, and they put out the fire, and we were okay. Uh-huh. And it was and it was fairly far away. This year, I probably spent a month or so where I couldn't breathe. Uh, that's uh, scary. I mean, that's scary. And they're, yeah. and they're saying there's nothing they can do about it. So yeah, I want, government I can't rescue it. Shows me just how inept government big agencies are. Is every time you watch a video. Of a uh, of a fire, you you watch firemen driving, you watch firemen mm-hmm. walking, you watch firemen holding a shovel, uh, you watch firemen uh, uh, pouring water on a building that is already destroyed. 
you almost never see anybody doing anything that would actually um, contain the fire. It was almost never. Uh, it, it's, uh, and I look for it. Uh, I, I study this thing, and I can't find very many images of, of doing that. And uh, you see them, you know, they fly the planes, but you don't see them put the fire to retard where it needs to be, which is not on the flames, but on the uh, the area and the direction that the flames are, are headed. We just, no. we, we just don't know how to respond. It. I remember when I lived, uh, the year I sold my Montecito home, uh, they, uh, that year, they, there was this horrible set of fires that uh, came up from the south. And the one thing that California did not want, the state of California did not want, is they did not want it to race through Montecito, which is the, in the top two or three zip codes of the United States in terms of affluence. And so with property tax, you know, our property tax in our home in Montecito was like $75,000 a year. And, and we had a bungalow compared to you know, most of our neighbors in Montecito. And so the state, which was bankrupt, could not afford to have Montecito burn. So what they did is they set back fires. So they went right up to the houses that were on the, uh, the edge, and they set fires back up against the hills. Mm. Well, great. What happened is the first wind. time it rained, uh, mm-hmm. they mud had wind. mud flows, and they destroyed much of Montecito and killed a bunch of people in the process, and no one wanted to blame the backfires for causing it. It's... We, we just, the larger the organization, the more that it tends towards, uh, uh, towards chaos and malfeasance and uh, inappropriateness. I, you know, I've been translating uh, the opening chapters of Barashith. I think I'm in chapter seven of Barashith now. And one of the things that I noted is that the fall of man did not occur in the garden. The fall of man occurred outside of the garden. And what we get is, is God is exceedingly explicit on the behavior that he detests that is occurring outside of the, uh, of the garden. And that what you find is that when it was just Adam, he was good. When it was Adam and Shawa, they were mostly good. When it was the first family and all of a sudden now there's, there's four of them. Well, one of the four, yeah, not so good. But when they sense. when they started integrated and forming communities, according to God, they became evil, bad, rotten, miserable, vicious, ah. all of the time, every day. He said it was just absolutely pervasive. So you stop and you think, okay, so here is God very early on, five thousand years ago, and he's saying that mankind as he formed the first cities and communities and civilizations, was rotten all of the time, every day. And if you were to say to someone, well, can you please name a benevolent civilization, a civilization that treated its own people with respect, no caste system, uh, fair judicial system, uh, Equal opportunity for uh, for everyone doesn't force people into the uh, the, the military, um, and that uh, is uh, the politics are are that you have quality human beings uh, in leadership positions, and that that the name of civilization that is not trying to expand into its neighbor's territory and uh, taxing and enslaving its neighbor. Now I'm going to give you. The next 10 years, I want you to come back with a single civilization. Well, David came a little close to the mark, but uh, quite frankly, nobody did. We are, yeah. we are mankind. We can't do it. Yeah. We it, can't do it. It, when somebody says this, they always want to say, I think man is basically good. And I always say, no, they're not. No, they're are, not. Are, you, are you just not paying attention? Uh, is, Individual people, uh, the three of us, for example, we can be good or bad. There's things that we do that are really good, but there's things we do that are probably not so good. So individually, I think you can make an argument that man is good, but 
collectively, according to God and according to history, we're all bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're bad all the time. So collective man, societal man, uh, cultural man, political man, religious man is really horrible, horrible. So, and I don't think of anything has uh, has changed. Uh, you know, our response to COVID is a wonderful example of how bad collective man has become. And um, the protests that have been waged by Black Lives Matter is a great example of how hypocrisy uh, pervades um, people when they act collectively. So here we were in Babrashith uh, 2 9. Uh, we were at Yahweh, who is God Almighty, uh, enabled life to sprout up and grow from the ground. All kinds of trees were delightful, desirable, and pleasing in their visual appearance uh, and beneficial and good to eat as food. That's the first half of Babrashith 2 9. Uh, so what we learn is that in Babrashi, one and two and into three, almost every time that Yahweh's name is used, it is always Yahweh who is God Almighty. Mm -hmm. After we get past there, we very seldom see Yahweh and Elohim juxtaposed. So even God is <laughs> dumbs it down for us enough to uh, to say, okay, Yahweh is God. So when I mention this name, Yahweh, equate it with the title of God. And he is about life. He created life to uh, sprout up and grow. This is uh, Shemak. Shemak is a uh, marvelous word for I mean, branch, but it means uh, life increases in its uh, variety, its stature, promoting growth. And he even talked about Adama. Uh, yeah. Yah created Adam, masculine, from the Adama, mm -hmm. feminine. And so we okay. emerge from the ground. We're physical beings. Now, one of the things that people get so hung up with is, uh, is eating the forbidden fruit. God telling us, no, you can't eat it, and man rebelling against uh, God. But that's not the scenario that God paints. God's saying all kinds of trees every kind of tree that you could possibly imagine. And it's not like this one tree is really shiny, really delicious, really pretty, and all the other trees are crappy and worm rotten and ugly and unhealthy and sour and displeased. No, it says, I got every kind of tree you can imagine that is delightful, desirable, and pleasing. Not only in their visual appearance and beneficial and good, they're nutritious and acceptable and appropriate as food. So you've got countless thousands, millions, billions of good choices. So it's not a situation where God is saying, ah, I'll tell you what, I'm going to put this really crappy tree over here. I'm going to put uh, this really uh, snazzy tree over here and tell you, you can't eat the one that looks pretty. It isn't, uh, that isn't the case at all. In this case, man would have to go way out of his way and would have to deliberately want to frustrate God's instructions to eat from either of these trees. And he says, the tree of lives, chayam, of renewals and restorations, was in the center of the sheltered garden, the Gan. Okay, so there is this tree of lives. It's the, uh, the tree that helps to counter the effect of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it is called the tree of lives for a reason, plural. And that is, they were obviously living their life so there must be an additional life. And so there is. There is our physical, mortal existence, and there is an eternal, 
energy-based spiritual existence. And that's why this is the tree of life. It expands one from another. And then this reads, this is the conclusion of Barashith 2.9. Along with the tree of the knowledge, it's Hadayat, the acquisition of information with a focus on the application of discernment and judgment for the purpose of perceiving and comprehending. Good. Tob. That which is beneficial and proper, favorable and desirable, agreeable and pleasing, moral and appropriate, useful and valuable. Well, up to that point, pretty cool trait, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Who's going to fight the acquisition of information that can be used to exercise good judgment that helps you perceive and comprehend that which is good, beneficial, proper, valuable, agreeable? Well, the fact of the matter is they were living directly communicating with Yahweh in an environment where everything you looked at was beautiful. It was obviously climate controlled. Um, Yahweh had created Chawa and Adam, so they were perfectly suited for one another. They complemented one another. There was a synergy between the two of them. They were obviously attracted to one another. And there were all forms of life in the garden that uh, Adam and Chawa could engage with and, uh, and uh, enjoy. And so the food was great. The weather was great. The company was great. Everything was as good as good gets. But this tree had something else. And the only thing that they would would gain by this tree is what follows because they already had what preceded it. They already had the knowledge of good. They were going to gain Ra evil. Now, Ra is an interesting term. You know how it's written, uh, Kirk? Yes, obviously it's a head, a roach, and it's pointing towards a eye, which is usually mm-hmm. is not uh, related yep. to Yahweh, so it's right. man's point of view or his perspective going his ma- right. going his way. It's man's way. perspective. Yeah, it's man's perspective, perspective on man, right? Mm-hmm. The, yeah. uh, this is the my, head, my idea. Yeah, the Ra, the head, is looking at the eye. And the eye, yeah. right? You know, there, there's, there's two words that, uh, that are pronounced the same in English that are very different in Hebrew: ra'a and uh, ra'a. And the, the uh, difference here uh, is whether it's an L, an lf or a name. And so, mm-hmm. is it? Man's perspective on man, the head looking to, uh, listening to man's point of view, the I, the aim, Mm -hmm. or is it man focusing on, listening to, observing, yeah, uh, represented by the LF. So So two words, very, very similar. The only difference Mm -hmm. is what's your focus, what are you looking at, who are you listening to? Yeah, yeah. And... So the Hebrew word for evil, for harmful, for corrupt, for immoral, for uh, being malignant, being disagreeable, being depraved and displeasing and troubling is written man focusing on man's perspective. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you're shamaring, you're also incorporated in that word is to respond. So it's more than just studying it, looking at it. You are responding to it. Right. So, um, bad news. Yes. Bad news. So, there, uh, your this particular tree of the knowledge of good and bad was providing them with the acquisition of information related to that which was harmful, corrupt, inappropriate, malignant, disagreeable. Dayat is a derivative of yada meaning to know in a relational sense, to be acquainted with, to consider, to perceive, to discriminate, to distinguish, to recognize and acknowledge. 
comes to God in most cases, the more one diets, knows, the more likely one is to yada, Yahweh. Now, it is interesting, too, that as you study the Torah and the prophets, uh, there's as much in the Torah and prophets that is disagreeable as there is that is pleasing. Mm -hmm. Uh, God's very careful to do what we try to do as parents, which is a parent will say uh, to a child that they ought not um, put their hand on the stove because uh, they will get burnt. And so that is a warning of a negative consequence. You uh, ought not go out and stay out late at night uh, in, a, in a troublesome area because you might get uh, mugged. Uh, you, uh, you ought not order a uh, shrimp cocktail from a roadside diner because you might get really sick. <laughs> Uh, you know, you ought not play with a loaded gun because you might get killed. Uh, you know, you ought not lay down in the middle of the street because you might get run over. It's, um, we tell our children the things that they ought to be careful about uh, that are, have negative consequences. God does a lot of that. Telling this, you ought not do this because here's the consequence. Uh, and we... We also say, you know, you ought to be uh, uh, knowledgeable. You ought to take the time to think things through and make quality decisions. You ought to demonstrate character. If you see somebody else that's, that's hurting or needs help, you ought to care enough, uh, be human enough to go help them. You know, there, there are times where a calculated risk is worth taking, um, that if everyone simply allows evil to prevail and no one stands up, what you end up with is, is a holocaust. Yeah. And so there are things worth risking your life, risking your fortune, risking your health, risking your reputation to stop. And so we will also talk to our children about the, the value of logic and reason and, and of information and uh, of character and of family, of integrity. Um, so knowledge, the full scope of knowledge is presented throughout the Torah. It's a very real book. And, and today, now that we are on the, the other side of this decision to be exposed to good and evil, we really need a full exposure. We, we need to know why God wants us to walk away from the inducements and the enchantments that are so uh, freedom depriving of man. Yes. Mm -hmm. they, it's the COVID response that demonstrates why God is so anti human political and religious schemes. Because the COVID response is we're going to curtail you from earning a livelihood, which makes you not only more dependent but robs you of your sense of value and character. And we're going to deprive you of your freedom, which is God's single greatest objective, is to make certain that we're free. And then we're going to, uh, uh, going to mock and silence. In fact, in the liberal media now, in, in Facebook and, uh, and other places where, information is shared, we're going to block access to any information that's counter to our objective. So we're going to restrict access to information, which means now you can't even make an informed decision. So it's our, our response to COVID demonstrates why God is so opposed to human political and religious schemes. Uh, he wants us to be free. He wants us to be well-informed, and he wants us to understand the value of, of work. And the most valuable form of work is working with him, taking the time to study his word, taking the time to share his word, taking the time to, uh, to reason with people who are interested in knowing him. 
That's work we all should be uh, celebrating. So I would say that knowledge without the proper perspective and associations devoid of a conscience and judgment, now that can lead to arrogance and self-reliance. Look at academia. Alone, unconnected to the source of life, knowledge has caused men to believe that they are all that matters, that they have Mm -hmm. all the answers. Some even come to think that they are responsible for life and death. Boy, you listen to politicians like uh, your governor, uh, like Fauci, like so many others in the world. I mean, they... They come across as if they're responsible for life and death. A few throughout time have considered themselves to be gods. And there are those who act like gods even today. And and in this light, Satan has knowledge of God's existence and yet does not yada know him in a familial way. Diet knowledge and our nasama conscience, which is the ability to be discerning, discriminating, judgmental, and moral, they are collaborative. One without the other has very limited value. So it's interesting that since God knew that we were going to avail ourselves of the knowledge of good and evil, he equipped us to process that. He equipped us to be able to deal with it long before it happened. Now, why do you think he did that? Why did he give Adam a nasama Uh before Adam could use it in a dealing, uh, in a discerning way with uh, information of of good and bad? Well, I assume it came as a package, just like when you're born. But what do you mean? Why 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 did he specifically give Adam and Osama before he technically would have to have one relative to the tree of the knowledge of good and bad. Well, at least he'd be a listener. I mean, yep. in the word. Yep. Um, they could have an intelligent in, in conversation. The, they could have yeah. a good argument. You know? Yeah, fair uh, yes, it yes, would, yes. It, it's just like when Yahweh uh, revealed all of the animals to, uh, to Adam just to see how he would interact with them. Uh, mm-hmm. He obviously exposed discriminating then. Yeah. Homo sapiens outside of the garden without an Osama to Adam, which would be both men and women, and they just did not interest Adam. Yeah. They were on a completely different level. Yeah. And it, so God said, I'm going to give man this Nasama conscience. The disparity between our ability to think would not be so great that we would be uninteresting to him. So we have an Asama hmm. because it's the only way we can be interesting to God. And he gave us an Asama so that once we made this decision that we were going to access both good and bad information, we would be prepared to process it in an intelligent way. Pretty Twofold. Pretty astute. Well, yeah. Yeah. So... A nasama and access to good information are prerequisites of meaningful choice. If you do not have good information, if your access to information is truncated, as it was, you know, look at the uh, the 2,000 years, uh, not quite that long, but maybe 1,700 years of the rule of the Roman Catholic Church. Well, do you think people had access? Do you think people had access to good information about God or anything else? No. No. So how could anybody make an intelligent decision? And and even if you were in the the upper echelon of the Roman Catholic hierarchy and you had access to a uh, to the Torah and prophets, it's it's now written in Latin, which is a crappy translation of a really rotten Greek translation. And let's just say that you were one of those people that cut through the the uh, indoctrination and said, you know, I'm going to study this and come to whatever conclusion, wherever the words lead is where I'm going to go. Well, first of all, do you think that you would be in the Roman Catholic hierarchy where you have access to this information if you were an independent thinker? 
<laughs> no. No. So how many independent thinkers do you think there were in the Roman Catholic hierarchy? <laughs> they were buried out in the yard. Yeah, that is zero. Yeah, <laughs> is the is the answer to that question. Well let's just pretend there was one. Uh-huh. What are the likelihood that they're going to throw away that luxurious lifestyle and be tortured to death to to try to impress on the others that what they were doing were, was wrong when they had a zero percent chance of success. Wow. So no, it just, zero. Yeah, it didn't happen. Yeah, ain't gonna happen. And nobody yeah. else had, yeah. had any information. So even if you have a functional Nasama conscience, if you don't have access to good information, it's of no value to you. So the combination is a prerequisite for choice, for justice. Uh, you cannot be an effective juror or judge in any case unless you have quality information and can uh, process it rationally. If you can't do both, if you don't have both, it's impossible to be just. It is actually impossible to be moral. You can, logic is of no value if no. you're applying it to rotten information. True. All the information True. in the world is of no value to you if you don't know how to process it logically. So to make an informed choice, to render, render a wise decision, to issue a moral judgment, to deliver a just verdict, to reach a reasoned conclusion, one must first know the facts, and then you must be able to process that information in a reasonable and rational way, and that occurs when we exercise our conscience, our nasama, to be discriminating and judgmental. It is through making connections and understanding the relationships between things that we are able to arrive at reasoned conclusions regarding the evidence. And this then gets us into the predicament of humankind. In most societies throughout time, there was an exceedingly uh, prevalent effort to restrict information. If you were part of the masses, you were told what to believe. And you were given no access to any information that was counter to the religious and political establishment. You know, a, uh, a grunt in the military throughout time is never trained to think. They're never trained to understand all of the implications of battles and maneuvers and this sort of thing. It's only the officers. And so... If you're amongst the, uh, the, the grunts, you're not trained to think. You're not given information to think. No, it's drilled in you to be strong, you know, to exercise. It's drilled in you to know the, the rank system. It's drilled in, in you to uh, know how to salute. It's drilled in you to know how to respond to an order. It's drilled into you that, uh, well, that whoever you're told is an enemy is a life uh, not worth living and that you must protect uh, your own at, uh, at all costs. You're told how to operate your weapon. You're uh, not told why an enemy is an enemy or how to maneuver to achieve a reasonable result. So all of these things have to work hand in hand and, And what we have done in society is either we've restricted access to information, which is typical, or we have made the consequence of thinking, of rendering a just moral conclusion so egregious that very few people are willing to do it. Yeah. You know, I, I recall one of the times when I was on an airplane, I was talking about homosexuality, and I said, Listen, I've got no issue with homosexuality. I'm, uh, many of my best friends are homosexual. I do not care what somebody does in their, uh, in their private life. My only issue with homosexuality is when it is promoted as normal. Because clarity is a normal. It's 1% to 2% of the population. That is the very definition of abnormal. 
And when it's yeah. promoted as good, I have a bigger problem with it because it does shorten people's life span. And it's it's not good for society as a whole. That doesn't mean that with society is is harmed by some percentage of the people being hom- homosexual. It's not. But if everyone celebrated homosexuality, but it was a homosexual, we'd have no society. <laughs> uh, you know, the the fact of the matter is that there are negative consequences, and it's not normal. So the politicizing it uh, as as a positive and as normal bothers me because it shows our inability to think. And I remember the two people that overheard this conversation and they had an absolute condition that how dare you, you're offending me. You know, you're I'm going to complain to uh the uh the people who was on an airline who are running the airline so that uh they preclude you from uh, being able to fly again. How so See, were you how so were you of being offensive? Because I, I said that being homosexual was abnormal, not normal. It's factual. I mean, it's overwhelmingly yeah. factual. And that rather than being a a good, it has negative consequences. Yeah, and a family unit with a male and a female was is always would always yes. be better for the child than than not. I mean, no, yes. you can't really argue that. It doesn't mean yeah, you can't be loved by someone. If you look still, at the history of Greece and Rome, when Greece and Rome, I had. Um, many, many leaders that were homosexual. Uh, there mm-hmm. were others that many, many were uh, were involved in incest. Many, many were involved in bestiality. But mm-hmm. if you also correlate the propensity engage in those things with their overall behavior and edicts and the way they treated other people, you would see that there was a direct correlation between very evil and bad leadership and these uh, um, behaviors. Hmm. So there is a historical precedence that's not good. Now, I find it interesting because we're here, we're talking about homosexuality, that God actually says nothing about homosexuality. The, uh, the two statements that are, uh, are translated uh, homosexual, there's only two, uh, that both of those have nothing to do with homosexuality. They have all to do with the closest thing that we could equate it to would be rape, where you're you're taking advantage of another person, not only without their consent, but in a manner that demonstrates one's superiority to over someone who doesn't have the physical ability to uh, to uh, to hold them off. And so God does not want you to overpower someone a- in a sexual way. And to force them to have sex with you. So it's it's the most egregious forms of rape that he is speaking out against. So it's not a, a situation where Yahweh is uh, is telling this, you know, don't do that. He's uh, far more interested in rape and and in forced, uh, non-compliant, non-mutually compliant mm-hmm. uh, sexuality, just as he's against bestiality and uh, and incest and pedophilia. Uh, so I've got no issue it from personal point of view. I've got no issue from it from uh, Yahweh's Torah point of view. Uh, my issue with it is the same issues that I have with all religious edicts and political edicts, is that you know, God's not fond of them, and almost all of them are either hypocritical or irrational or counterproductive. And in this case, the politically correct uh, Promotion of homosexuality as normal and good is a perfect example. It would be fine if we were to say a lot of people are homosexuals. We, uh, you know, it's between one and two percent of the population. They should not be harassed because of it. I'm all for that. Yeah. Uh, shouldn't lose jobs because of it. Absolutely agree with it. Um, so it's because it's not appropriate to harass anybody for a. Uh, a choice of, of that kind. Yeah. Uh, Anybody has free that, will. Yeah, but that's not what they intend to do. So it's, for the most part, we try to preclude the exercise of good judgment. Uh, when 
um, you should see what happens when I'm talking to a liberal and I talk about the hypocrisy of Black Lives Matter. And I say that, that any organization that points the finger and says that the death of black people is because of bad behavior of white people and, uh, and institutional racism. And I said, well, that's absolute nonsense in, in the United States because in the United States, 93% of the time that a black person is killed is by another black person. So there is a problem, but the problem is not the one that you claim it to be. And so if you really care about black lives, you ought to be looking internally into the African-American community. Well, it's a statement of absolute fact. It's irrefutable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and yet, you should see the way that a liberal will respond to that. You know, how I've, I've dare you? That line. <laughs> yeah. How dare you say that? <laughs> Pretty much. You know, so, you know, we are we're truncating speech that's based on evidence and reason. Now, what I'm about to share resonates with very few people hoping that, you know, one day there'll be more. I'd like you to ponder something that at least I think is profound. The reason that there is no longer any hope for the world as a whole, you'll notice never on this program do I say, you know, we could solve our national debt if we did this. We could defend ourselves against the onslaught of Islam if we did this. We could resolve America's uh, uh, um, uh, destruction of its economy if we did why, you know. Um, I don't say that because I know there is no chance that we can uh, can save the uh, the country. Uh, so the reason for this discussion is just to have a, a, an understanding as to why it's a waste of time to talk about making America great again. Uh, and and that is because the average American has lost the ability to rationally, morally, uh, or to exercise good judgment. So, because most people are, uh, are too greedy, too uh, conscienceless, too religious, too political, uh, that they have deliberately corrupted both sides of the dyad knowledge and the shaman conscious equation. You know, in totalitarian societies, like those found in a fascist, socialist, uh, and Islamic nation. There's quite a few. I think there's like 55 Islamic nations, probably another uh, 30 socialist nations, and, uh, and uh, you know, every Islamic nation is fascist. Uh, and then there's uh, there's a handful of uh, communist nations. Uh, in those countries, access to information is constrained. That's the reason why the Internet, for example, is con- access to information on the Internet is so constrained in China. Hey, you would think that those people who promote liberalism in America and think it is enlightened uh, and that it is intellectual would put two and two to- uh, together and say, wait a minute, uh, and <laughs> Communist countries, which is the open expression of liberalism, there is absolute constraints on access to information. Huh. They don't think that, uh, that through. But nonetheless, in a fascist uh, or uh, socialist or communist country, uh, in a religiously controlled country, access to information is absolutely constrained and controlled. And much of what is available is inaccurate. Without access to good data, reason is useless, and thus wise choices are impossible. The so-called free and democratic countries' information is so abundant, we nearly drowned on it, which is the opposite of that. In America, we have access to so much information that it is overwhelming, especially since most people lack the ability to process it. If you don't have a filter, too much information is counterproductive. If you can't swim... The swimming pool will kill you. The masses are therefore controlled by robbing people of their ability to choose wisely, especially between man and God, between good and evil, right and wrong. For this reason, elitists created this immoral code known as political correctness. Based upon the irrational notion of being intolerant of intolerance, it makes being judgmental and thus 
discerning and discriminating a sin. So no matter how prevalent or accurate the facts are, without the ability to process them judgmentally, wise conclusions and thus good choices are impossible. As a result, men and women have abrogated their free will, as most everyone on the planet has been either rendered unable to process information properly, or they're deprived of accurate information. In the West, where information is prevalent, political correctness has become the moral code of universities, of the media, of politics, and now of society in general. It is the soul of America's national religion, social secular humanism, the doctrine of man, if you, uh, if you will. Uh, it is where man is the supreme being. And make no mistake, it is a control mechanism, one designed to condition the masses so they're easier to manipulate and doctrinate and police. Now, I'll give you an example. If I were to mm-hmm. provide a mountain of information which proves conclusively that the religions of man, eh, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, are wrong, it makes no difference to those who are unable to process that evidence rationally. I can provide overwhelming mm-hmm. proof that Yahweh exists and that he revealed his covenant to man and the Torah and prophets, but it seldom resonates with those who have been poisoned by human schemes. I can reveal that the fate that awaits humankind over the next 13 years is, uh, is devastating without motivating people to change because their consciences are no longer engaged. You can talk to a liberal about comparing East and West Berlin, East and West Germany, the Iron Curtain part of Europe, Eastern Europe, with Western Europe. North and South Korea. You can show them that here are examples of the exact same people, ethnicity, exact same culture, exact same client, or climate and location, exact same opportunity, just with either a liberal application of government, communism, or a less abundant application of government in terms of uh, free economics uh, and, uh, and republic uh, uh, free elections. And 100% of the time, the freer people are, the more individual responsibility they have, the vastly better society is in terms of every aspect of life. And you can say, this is universal. It has been this way throughout time. As a matter of fact, you can't name a, another example. I mean, the ultimate example is, is as I say, East and West Berlin, East and West Germany, uh, North and South Korea. Look at the difference between life in Taiwan and life in China. So why is it that you can present that to the liberal and they go, but it just they have no capacity to deal with that reality. Their consciousness are no longer engaged. As a result, all of man's political and religious schemes oppress and police the masses by controlling access to information or by criminalizing thoughtfulness. You know, for example, during the millennia-long political and religious domination of the Roman Catholic Church, the union of church and state kept the population ignorant and enslaved. The same can be said of communism during the last century. And throughout most of these periods, anyone who challenged the edicts of a Catholic or Orthodox Christian cleric, a communist or fascist dictator, or an Islamic caliph was tortured and killed. Discernment was not allowed because reason is the enemy of all political and religious schemes. Today in the West, the universal application a political correctness assures that anyone in the public arena who is judgmental will be condemned, humiliated, and silenced. What is the fact? Yeah, Newt Gingrich was such a great example. He, 
uh, when uh, he was actually running for president and uh, and had the uh, the lead in a uh, primary, uh, he gave a speech on the mythology of the of the Palestinian people. And oh, said, yes, you know, to, I heard that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He said, you know, to to talk about a Palestinian people and a and a nation of Palestine uh, just proves that you don't know your history because there have never been a Palestinian people. There's never been a place called uh, Palestine. There's never been a nation of Palestine. And it's all a myth to create the illusion that Israel is somehow occupying land that belongs to somebody else and that these people are an ethnicity that have been deprived of their nationhood. And says none of that is true. And here's the history of it. And what he said was absolutely correct. It was impossible to rationally or evidentially refute. And he was mocked to the point that uh, within a week's time, his candidacy was over. You know, in an Islamic country. I don't care if it's true. I don't like it. (laughs) Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Uh, In an Islamic country, if uh, you were to expose Muhammad as a pedophile and as a rapist and Allah as a terrorist and, uh, and the uh, the Quran is an exceedingly uh, ignorant book and an accurate book. Uh, you will be killed and in a court you can say, wait a minute, what I'm saying is Allah admits that he's a terrorist. Uh, Muhammad admits that he's a pedophile. Muhammad admits that he's a rapist. Muhammad admits that he's a mass murderer. Muhammad admits that he created Islam for the purpose of robbing others as opposed to spread his religion. So why are you harassing me when all I'm doing is telling you what Muhammad himself claimed? Do you think that evidence and reason, the truth, will serve as an alibi? No. No. Not, Not one chance in a billion. Now, I've traveled in over 150 countries, and I've studied history. And I can tell you that man's legacy is is abysmal. For nearly 6,000 years across the face of this planet, a malignant concoction of politics and religion has served to enslave the masses for the benefit of clarity. And even that was not enough for the unending line of ruthless and egocentric leaders. They've always coveted more. So with revolting regularity, Cleric and King would send their subjects off to war to confiscate even more power, tribute, and territory for themselves. On a global scale, man's history, both ancient and modern, is troubling. With only occasional, outside of family and friends, moments of good, brightening, and otherwise hideous tapestry. Given the choice between good and evil, world leaders have almost universally chosen evil. The same could be said with truth and lies. Throughout time, the overwhelming preponderance of people have had their freedoms decimated, just as happening now through the COVID response, through a mix of oppression and fear. Choosing to live outside their religious and political strengths of these men and their schemes enjoying such a severe consequence, most people abrogate whatever freedom they may otherwise have enjoyed. Yeah, look what happens to somebody who rebels against the um, edicts of these governors and uh, and world leaders to deprive them of liberty. So that's where we find ourselves. And uh, I can tell you quite certainly, it is not where God wanted us to be. Now, there are a couple of other additional insights into the tree of the knowledge of good and bad, especially with regard to knowing things which are evil, harmful, morally inappropriate, malignant, and disagreeable. Things which are of no value, morally depraved, displeasing, and corrupt. Man brought these things upon himself. It is therefore inappropriate to blame God for pain and suffering, for crippling diseases, for disabilities and death. 
Rather than saying a loving God wouldn't allow suffering to occur, we should realize that love requires a choice, the very choice that we humans made to become acquainted with adversity. Human pain and suffering are a consequence of the choice Adam and Chawa made in the garden and of the subsequent choices we humans have rendered after them. God said, if you eat of that tree, you're going to die. Death was the consequence. We all die. For those who fail to appreciate the purpose of free will or acknowledge its value or consequence and who continue to lament over a God who would allow any atrocity or misfortune to occur on our planet. Please consider what you're asking of him. If Yahweh were to intervene and stop anything bad from occurring, the result would be to remove consequence from choice. Doing so would completely undermine the benefit of free will, which in turn would make love impossible and our very existence pointless. Why should you talk about Yahweh's name, his Torah? Why talk about the covenant if there is no consequence to choosing to ignore it or to Mm -hmm. rebel against it? Why talk about life if there is no death? Why talk about bad if there is no good? There would be no reason for the universe to have been created because Yahweh would no longer be able to grow through the loving relationships we're able to form with him. The idea of God allowing people to choose to be bad rather than follow his instructions is fairly easy to understand. However, when it comes to a child suffering or dying prematurely, it's difficult for us to appreciate how even the most trivial decisions we make can change our futures and those of others. So I'd ask you, should God intervene and stop a company from dumping pollutants into the ground, the air and water, to keep a child from getting cancer? Or should man intervene and stop that? Man. Man. If so, what about altering trivial events, which might cause someone to drive a little faster or a little slower on a trip? Consume and additional drink or get distracted by a text when the result leads to an accident. The smallest thing might not only affect the rest of their existence, but might also impact the lives of otherwise innocent bystanders and even the initial victims of an accident. They don't stand alone. What about the extended family members, close friends, co-workers, mm-hmm. and neighbors of an adult accident victim? What if one of those um, killed? People that are in, you know, interact with those people on a daily basis. Yeah. You know, what if somebody killed would have become you know, a, a teacher, a doctor, an inventor, a philanthropist? What if they would have become a rapist, a pedophile, or a murderer? Does God preclude people from living who are going to become bad? Does he only allow people to live who would be good? What's the purpose of having a doctor if there was no disease? Why have a philanthropist if there is no poverty? And this works the other way as well. They may have, there may have been an Austrian with an affinity for painting, kind of like Kirk. He liked landscapes, though. I think Kirk likes to draw people. Paint more people. And life. Yeah, Kirk's more into life. He's a little different than the Australian with the funny mustache, who for some reason was turned down when he uh, uh, applied for admission at the Vienna Academy of Art. The person who was hired instead rejected the, an 18-year-old boy's application. In his opinion, the lad's work lacked an appreciation of the human form. How much different would the world have been if Adolf Hitler had spent his life drawing cityscapes rather than destroying them? Every decision has a ripple effect. Who knows what the confluence of events brings 
uh, when a situation turns horrible and so happens that an innocent person is harmed. Even if it were possible, at what point should God stop meddling in the minutia of an endless stream of variables to prevent a seemingly senseless tragedy to occur? What repercussions would his intervention have on so many others who are not directly involved? You know, one of the things that I I learned as I was retranslating the creation account is that God specifically allowed for chaos. Without chaos, there is no purpose to to the universe, no purpose to life. You you have to have uh, unforeseen events. It has to be, even for God, to have things have the opportunity to occur that were not foreseeable. Otherwise, what's the purpose? If if everything that happens you knew was going to happen in the way that it happens, and there's no chance that it will happen any other way. Bore yourself to death. Oh, my God, would it be boring. You know, if every story was the same, it was all happily ever after. Why would you write a story? They're all the same. Why cultivate a relationship when every relationship is going to be identical? How would you learn empathy if there was no pain? How would you learn to appreciate life if there was no death? No struggle. How could love mean anything to you if there was no hate? What would be the value of having children if nothing you did had any influence over their lives? You know, I like to play golf. I have thought, you know, in eternity, I'm going to have the sweetest right to left soft draw. I'm going to hit the ball 300 yards plus. Every shot is going to land in the middle of the fairway, and I'm going to have the crispest, sweetest irons that land softly on the green and roll up right next to the pen so that uh, I have a tap-in birdie, Uh, maybe an eagle here or there. And why not a (laughs) hold of one? And to go out and play these magnificent courses with my favorite friends like Kurt, and uh, and yeah, enjoy the play view with you if you can do that. And and just stripe it down the fairway and uh and shoot well I should be able to shoot an eighteen. Yeah. <laughs> what fun would it be? What fun would it be? Really? Yeah. I don't know. Why bother? This is no contest. No. Why bother? Uh you know, if uh why bother? You know, every decision has a ripple effect. And if Yahweh decided to present, prevent certain bad things from happening, at what point would he stop? If he engages to thwart a terminal illness for newborns, at what age does he stop intervening? Two, three, five, seven, nine, twelve, fifteen, eighteen? What if God cures all diseases? Ignoring the obvious and enormous ramifications, then should he stop at all fatal accidents? And if he stops all fatal accidents, should he then stop all random acts of brutality? It's a slippery slope that can easily result in an existence where there are no bad consequences for any actions, making choice irrelevant for all action. There are a couple of extra thoughts I'd like to consider. First, Yahweh has intervened on occasion to preclude the existence of uh, the, preclude the exercise of free will. When he recognized that the cost of not doing so would be catastrophic. The flood was necessary. Had God not intervened and flooded that reason where people were being so Uh, malignant, um, so vicious, uh, so oppressive, humankind would not have survived. Uh, The choice uh, with the situation in Egypt to um, 
free the Hebrew slaves. Right. Another example mm -hmm. where if God had not intervened, there would have been no Yisrael and Yahudim to act as prophets to convey the Torah prophets and Psalms to us. The consequence would have been enormous. What if God had not intervened at the time of Hezekiah and allowed the Assyrians to wipe out Yahuda uh, and Jerusalem along with the rest of uh, Israel? And they went the way of the dodo along, along with the Philistines. What would we have? So God has intervened. He's going to intervene again. You know, he is going mm -hmm. to stop the flood of jihadists from destroying Israel. He's going to wipe out political and religious man. He's going to return the, the polluted earth to the conditions that were experienced in Eden. Well, had he not, we wouldn't have this book, would we? We wouldn't have these Correct. scrolls. So yep. then, then and, where would we all be? So yeah. Then where would we be? We'd have no way of knowing God. They. The absolute proof that God allows and has to allow man to act badly is what occurred to terminate the perfect conditions that Yahweh enjoyed with Adam and Shawa in the garden. He allowed Satan in. Satan was allowed to misquote Yahweh. Chawa took him one further and was even worse in her uh, in her statements regarding her that. translation yeah yeah her uh, her translation was not very accurate and and of course uh adam all adam did the same thing chawa did chawa blamed uh, satan uh, adam blamed uh, chawa none of them took responsibility i mean we 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 progressed we jumped right forward to the new world order and, and the approach of communism where no one is to blame. Uh, so God allowed them to choose badly. And he allowed the consequence of that bad choice to occur. So since God obviously allowed this, why are believers so reluctant to accept the obvious reality that he has allowed the same crime to continue unabated for a millennia, and therefore they can't trust what they call to be their scripture? You know, there are tens of thousands of old manuscripts which tell a different story than this idea of, I can't believe God would allow anyone to corrupt his word. Now, as a result of free will, God has either allowed his word to be manipulated and twisted, as he did in the garden, or he was powerless to stop it, making such a God feeble in comparison to man. Because man was obviously able to corrupt it. Mm -hmm. The facts are clear. Clerics conspired to corrupt Yahweh's testimony to serve their religious agenda, and the victims have seldom cared enough to correct or thwart them. Both sides of this perverse equation have made a choice and have to live with the consequences. And there is the problem of uh, those who would specifically request that um, that uh, why doesn't God he intervene, intervene on my behalf? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Come on, God. How come you can't make me more popular? How come you can't help me get the job? How come you can't uh, uh, save my marriage? How come you can't um, uh, solve my financial problems? It's not God's business. He has no interest in those things, and 99.9% .9 of the people that are asking him for those things don't know him anyway, and he doesn't know them. You know, and those of us who have been fortunate enough to get to know him, we uh, make very few requests of him. Uh, because God gives us most everything we need without us asking for it, because most of the things that we need are derived from studying his testimony, and he is more than happy to help us understand it and deduce insights from it. Do you guys have anything else to add as we, before we move on to uh, what will be another chapter? This was uh, chapter is uh, uh, Adam Mann. It's the second chapter of what will be volume two 
of, uh, of Yada Yawa. Uh, it's a covenant-based uh, volume. Well, I would like to say something to uh, mm -hmm. because so many people are listening to this that they need to. This uh, the show is um, condensed because we don't have that much time, and we cover and cover all the big points and stuff, and then you have to put up with my interruptions and uh, mm -hmm. stuff like that. But there's so mm -hmm. much commentary that's brilliant. I mean, I I I look at the the verses you do first and play with them and see what I can see and what I can extract from them. But then I go back and read the commentary and, and some of it is, is so wonderful. And it truly is. I'm not just shining your own. It's just really good. You're very good at what you do. And you're missing, you're missing a treat if you're not, uh, if you're not reading along with us because this is, uh, this is so insightful. Every now and then there's you know, one that pops out and you just go, it was like the one the other day when you said, you know, he, he portrayed, he, uh, paraded all of the animals before Adam, mm -hmm. and that means we obviously have to have Homo sapiens. Right. If they were Neanderthals, he had those, but but mm -hmm. then they were not interesting to him, and that's obviously because they were not interested because they didn't have an asoma. And just right. as, just and con conversely, they were very interested in Cain because he had one. You know, right. And they observed him like a dog, like wolves, figured out right. how to they, get along. They wanted, they, yeah, yeah, they wanted to them. They yeah. want, I want to be like you. It's like the um, his, uh, Jungle Book song. You know, I want to be like that guy. So, um, uh, But they're just little insights that I never even thought about. To honest to goodness, I never even thought, and shame on me, that he would portray the homo sapien. I knew they were there. They've been around for 182,000 years or 180,000 yeah. years or something of that order. So, of yes. course, he had to betray him and say, what do you think? I mean, yeah. that's most, uh, those most interesting animal out there, are, other than so the, cool. the art park and the platypus. But other yeah, than that, 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 of course, right. so the kangaroo ain't bad either. But right. <laughs> yeah, and one of the things but, I mean, you we really please go read these English. things. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, one of the things we miss because of English translation is that all we think that God did is had Adam name the animals, but no. that's not the case. He the verb that God wow, is using. Uh, relative to the experience is Kara. He invited Adam to Call meet forth. with, to welcome, to engage yeah. with these yeah. uh, animals. And so it's, it's this marvelous term, Kara, is the verb that uh, is depicted in all of this. And, and then coming up with names for them, because all of Yahweh's names are descriptive, to come up with names for them after he encountered them and welcomed them into his presence and uh, and got to know them, then that name was meaningful. But uh, that mm -hmm. was the, the experience was let's enjoy life together. It's, it's got some, I created this marvelous universe for uh, for you, but the most interesting part of the universe is life. And I wrote this code called DNA, and we can manipulate it and create all of these various uh, uh, all the variations of it. Uh, and just look how magnificent it is. Um, and and if you, you, know, you talk about insights, the the fun part of rewriting, like uh, you know, I'm now you know, about 400 pages into volume two of uh, of Yada Yada, is you go back mm -hmm. and you retranslate all of the the passages you translated before, and then you begin to uh, to study them, and it, it just pours out with with remarkable insights that that take you to uh, such interesting places, and it's all reinforces uh, Yahweh's nature and what He is offering us and asking in return. And it's uh, it's really a voyage through words, uh, space, and time. Uh, mm. And so it is. It's a marvelous uh, thing to do. And and it's I just think that the the access to insights that are, are uh, that help us understand is they're so prevalent and they're so meaningful. The it's not a question of how do we come up with them, but instead, how is it possible for a man to have gone these past two thousand years and nobody come up with any of them? That is remarkable. We've been free for a long time. We've had public libraries for a long time. 
Yes. And you can look up yeah. footnotes. You can look up you know, all kind of books. The New York Library and Library of Congress, you can get all in the you know, yes. a lot of a lot of people go to Cambridge and uh, you know, in Oxford and they can find these things, but they don't care. Yeah, you know, I was reading care. something that uh, Leah objected to earlier today, and it was I was uh, writing about uh, the fact that God twice tells us in the uh, in the account uh, preceding the flood that that Noah did he engaged and acted in a way that was consistent with everything that Yahweh instructed, and so. Twice he says this, that that uh, Noah acted and, and responded in a way engaging, such that he did everything that Yahweh directed and asked it, and asked of him, and and I said so. You know, if you look at the word for instruct and and direct, it happens to be uh, conveys exactly the same message as this Torah. You know, Torah based on Yara means the source mm-hmm. from which instruction and direction flow. Yeah. And so and we now have access to the same instructions and even more than Noah had. And so we too are invited to, um, uh, aboard the ark, but because of the fact they've all been written down for us uh, we don't have to build the ark. So we're invited to war, just like Noah was and his family, but we don't have to build it. And I said, you know, it's kind of mm-hmm. like reading these books. You can benefit from the Hebrew translations and the insights that help bolster understanding, but you don't have to learn Hebrew. It's all there for you. So it's just like we're welcome to board the ark and don't have to build it. We're we are given Yahweh's testimony in the language that most of the world speaks English in such a way that the insights are provided for us to capitalize on without us all having to invest the time to learn Hebrew and create the translation. I can tell you that doing it's a lot of fun. I would encourage people doing it, but most people don't have that level of both well, time where you can invest that much time or the motivation to do so. And so just as God is offering us the ability to go on the ark without building it, he is offering us the opportunity to know him and be part of the covenant without uh, dissecting every Hebrew word. Well, unlike any other author I've ever found, you've got everything in the parenthetical where you can go in and look at it and say, oh, that's where it came from that. And it's an easy look up at that point if if you're not sure. If you disagree with where, why it was translated that way, but uh, that's, and, you know, that's your skill big, set where you big, the big stuff. That's, that's what drove me uh, yesterday to uh, uh, to dissect this uh, this difference between ra uh, ra ah and ra ah mm-hmm. to uh, the AA. to see to oh, observe well, all very either. good things and to be yes. rotten, evil, malignant is who's your focus on. Yeah. Are you looking at things of God or are you looking at things of man? So it's no matter how deeply you look, the more you have the opportunity to learn. Yeah. So uh, as we start this uh, this next chapter, uh, and we can begin this part because this is uh, – well, I think it's interesting that God gave, gave us these details um, – uh, there's not an enormous amount of teaching on those. So let's, well, the part where we're not uh, broadcasting but still recording, we'll go through the location of, uh, of Eden. He, he begins to say that a glistening river, a uh, Wahnahar, a brilliant stream, flowed through and departed, Yatsa, came through and was extended, serving and then proceeding from Eden. So, if it departed Eden, if it was extended from Eden, if it's men out of Eden, are we talking about the headwaters or the mouth on these rivers? Obviously, you talk about the headwaters. This is where they're beginning, not where they're ending. So all of these people that want to put Eden down there at the mouth of the Tigris and the Euphrates under what was once her, I'm sorry. You need to know the difference 
between the head and the tail. Okay. <laughs> Up and down, a little geography. <laughs> good, good to know. You know, make it through a little hydrodynamics. Uh, this is water. The water goes downhill. Even finding the arc. That was the one thing that was uh, always interesting, is that people looking for the arc on the top of Mount uh, Ararat. Now, mind you that Mer Mount Ararat is a volcanic mountain that has erupted uh, since the uh, the time of the, the arc. And therefore, the mountain uh, uh, peak is quite different than it was back then and much higher. But if, uh, if uh, you uh, uh, build a little uh, model in, uh, in a kiddie pool and then drain the kiddie pool, and then you put little uh, floaty boats, uh, you know, little rubber duckies and that sort of thing there, and you drain the water out. One of the things you're going to find out is that the hydronamics of water will, will pull it away from the highest uh, things. So water doesn't draw itself to the highest point. The flow of water will flow off of the highest point and, and push things away. So if you were looking for an, an arc in the mountains of Ararat, the last thing you would do is look on the summit of Ararat. That's the one place where you can be assured it would not be. Uh, and so that was the interesting thing about uh, finding the, the actual arc is, is actually creating a diorama, of, of a 3D diorama of the mountains of Ararat and uh, then filling a bowl, a basin full of water and putting a, uh, a model arc there and letting the water out and saying, hmm, where does it go? Hmm. And then looking there. That's uh, how it was uh, originally found. Uh, that and someone who could read this would know that the uh, the ark has to be somewhere close to uh, to uh, Lake Van and uh, in present day Turkey between there and uh, and Ararat because that's where these rivers all coalesce. So a glistening river flowed through and departed from Eden, which means the del delightful place of great joy, ultimate pleasure, favorable circumstances and extreme satisfaction. Uh, Eden was a resort. It was like um, uh, you see one of those uh, over the water uh, resorts in, uh, in uh, Indonesia, in uh, Bali and Bora Bora mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Oh, yeah. Water temperature's uh, 85 and it's crystal clear and there's uh, uh, always a lovely breeze blowing through the palm trees uh, and everything is beautiful and green and well, uh, Eden was like that. Um, to refresh, it says, the sheltered garden. And from there, it separated and became four headwater sources. So from a single source, we're going to have the headwaters, Roche. Roche means head. So this would be the source, the headwater sources of four rivers. The name of the first was the Pichon, Pichon to spring out and to spread out from push, meaning to spring up and act proudly and scatter. It winds its way through. So God's going to give you a lot of information here. He wants you to know where this was all occurring. There's a reason for that. And the reason he wants you to know where all of this was occurring is not so much that you would know the location of Eden, although you can. You can tell it from this. No, but God says fine. that it was east of Eden where man became so belligerent early on. Well, when you describe all of this, what you're going to find is that east of Eden was the area around Babylon. the Black Sea yeah. and down into Babylon. And so the one of the things that we learned fairly recently in the last 20 years is that the first human civilizations of any magnitude were along the shores of the Black Sea, and they were all eliminated in a flood some 5,000 years ago when the height of the Black Sea rose by 500 feet, and the Black Sea instantaneously turned from fresh water to salt water. And all of those civilizations are preserved 500 feet below this intensely cold water. And so he's saying it's the area east of the Black Sea, so he is letting us know where man became so belligerent and where we needed, he needed to clean house and has a, a fresh start. So 
that is the area, and then from that area down through Mesopotamia is the cradle of human society where civilizations, the first civilizations were born. And God begins, you know, and Daniel to tell us that Babylon is the mother of the harlots, and Babylon morphed into to Persia, Media Persia, and Media Persia morphed into Greece, Greece morphed into Imperial Rome, and Imperial Rome into the Roman Catholic Church, and then tread upon the whole world. So he's giving you the history of civilization by uh, telling you where to look. So it winds its way throughout all of the region of of Cha'ila. Now, Cha'ila would be Havilah, twisting and circuitous, uh, from to twist, to encircle, uh, to bring fear, pain, and anguish, where rationally, uh, where relationally, there is gold. Precious metals, rare earths, considerable wealth, and money. Well, in Barashith 25.18, speaking of Cha'ala, Yahweh says that Ishmael, the father of today's Arab Muslims, settled from Cha'ala to Shur, which is east of, uh, of Egypt as one goes towards Assyria and in uh, defiance of all of his relatives. Assyria was located between the Tigris Euphrates and what is today northern Iraq and Iran. If you were to travel from Egypt to Assyria, you would pass through eastern Turkey near its border with Syria, northern Arabia, Iraq, and Iran. So we know where we are, but more on that later. And the gold of that region, the uh, the Delium resin, and the precious stones there are valuable, pleasing, and beautiful. Well, the reference to gold, rare earths, precious metals, great wealth and splendor, as well as gemstones, could be a reference to the mines which exist in this particular region. I think Yahweh was referencing the opulence of Nineveh, the capital of first Babylon and uh, later the principal city of the Assyrian Empire. Man's first known religious and political schemes were conceived and perpetrated there. It was the birthplace of the sun god religion practiced today as Catholicism. It remains a religion of considerable wealth, money, and splendor, which separates the masses from God. The name of the second river is the Gishon, the Gihon. It winds through the whole of the land of Cush. Oh, boy, boy, I tell you what, the Cush, Cush is a sticky wicket uh, in terms yeah. of where Cush where is. But I'll share what, what, uh, what I've, uh, I've learned, and I am, I am not going to tread into the realm of the uh, emphatic. No. Yeah, of emphatic. I'm just going to share some thoughts with you. You can uh, choose to put Cush wherever you are most comfortable putting uh, Cush. Cush, uh, more commonly rendered C-U-S-H, although it's K-U-W-S-H in Hebrew. So K-W-S-H uh, uh, in Hebrew was the son of, of uh, Ham, which is actually Cham in Hebrew. Uh, in mm-hmm. addition to Mitzrayim, Put, and Canaan. Okay, so you can see uh, kind of where he might be in the scheme of things. Uh, Scholars want to put Cush to such that it represents Ethiopia because its root means black. Uh, But I'd be really careful with that. What is today Ethiopia was often part of Egypt at the time, and Egypt Mm -hmm. is uh, called Mitzrayim in the Torah, not Cush. And while there is plenty of evidence to connect Cush with ancient Egypt, at least in terms of of trade, that nation's genesis was still a thousand years hence, meaning that Yahweh was not describing an emerging culture in northern Africa. Further, the Nile flows north from central Africa, not south from eastern Turkey. You can believe what you want, but hey. But 
as it <laughs> relates to that last sentence, I am destroying the myth that Cush is next to Egypt and is Ethiopia because he said the headwaters of these rivers float out of Eden's area and they float mm-hmm. out of that area and they, there's only one river in Egypt uh, and mm-hmm. it happens to be the Nile and it flows, the Nile. In, it flows in the opposite direction and never gets Duh. anywhere close to where the other rivers intersect. So <laughs> we're not uh, it can't be located there but there is a, uh, a clue Nimrod the patriarch of uh, of religion and the king of Nineveh which was uh, in Assyria then called Babylon was a descendant of Cush and was known to have been a black man so we might surmise that Cush at least at this time represents what is today northern Iraq and Iran it is a region of America recently and foolish, unified under Shia Islam. It is the area which will one day soon serve as the headwaters of an all-Islamic Magog Federation, something the Torah's genealogies will also confirm. Now, as evidence of this theory, the Iranians call the 12,000-foot range, which towers above the modern Syria, city of Tabriz, the Kushe Dak, or the Mountains of Kush. Located in the upper northwestern finger of Iran, near Lake uh, Ermia, the Kush range is fewer than 200 miles from the headwaters of the Tigris and Euphrates, the next two rivers on the list. Also telling is the association of Kush, meaning black, which is the name of the world's largest inland sea, the Black Sea, which, not so coincidentally, is adjacent to the headwaters of these next two rivers. The name of the third river is the Tigris. The rapid uh, is, the, is the Hebrew word. The Tigris from uh, Chedek to prick and sting with the thorn and Chadar to rapidly surround to close and besiege, bringing impending doom and to forego and to reject. That certainly describes the nations that would be around. It uh, traveled east of Asher. Well, Asher is Assyria. So Mm -hmm. it travels east in the direction of Assyria, of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates, to Parath to break open and be fruitful. The Euphrates, meaning fruitful, is the largest river in Asia Minor and Mesopotamia. It's from Parath, fruitful in Hebrew. The Shedekel is Akkadian, ancient Assyrian and Babylonian language, pronunciation of what has since been renamed Tigris and Greek. So the Tigris River, as it's called now, is because following Alexander's conquest, it was given a Greek name, but that wasn't its original name. It was the Parath, just as Yahweh describes it, or fruitful river, as the Hebrew word means fruitful. And we know Akkadian and Hebrew are sister languages. It didn't bear the name Tigris, nor did they uh, until really the 3rd century BCE. Both tributaries of the Tigris began their 1,300-mile trek to the Persian Gulf in the mountains west and southwest of Lake Van in eastern Turkey, which is 200 miles due south of the easternmost shore of the Black Sea. The east branch begins its journey to the sea about 20 miles south of Lake Van, and the western source emerges 100 miles due west of Turkey's largest lake. Moving on to the Euphrates, its twin tributaries emerge 100 miles northwest and 50 miles due north of Lake Van, the latter not far away from the mountains of Ararat. From there, the waterway travels a great 1,700-mile arc west, east, south, and then southeast 
to the Persian Gulf. Walled in by volcanic mountains, Lake Van, like its neighbor, Lake Ermia, 150 miles southeast of Lake Van, has no natural outlet and thus is saline, as is the Black and uh, or as are the Black and Caspian Seas. Lake Van is among the largest and deepest lakes in the Middle East. Satellite photos depict it as a royal blue oasis surrounded by inhospitable and rugged, desolate terrain. Perfect for, yeah, well, walling off, if you will, the Garden of Eden. Turning to our attention to the Gishon, I have every confidence that it is the area shown on some maps as the uh, Araxis. The river's tributaries emerge northeast of Lake Van. During the century-long Islamic invasion, which followed Muhammad's death in 632, the river's name was changed from the Gaihun, making the original monitor quite similar to that found in Genesis. Today, the Arias, formerly the Gaihun, flows eastward from Turkey into the Caspian Sea. Ignoring the fact that God said that the headwaters of these four rivers, two of which are the Tigris and Euphrates, flowed from the same place and the same source, the same headwaters, renowned religious scholars continue to postulate claims that the Pishon is the Ganges, the Indus, or the Nile. Um, because, because oh it's just so oh, stupid. Context, context, context. Uh, hmm. Others place Eden at the delta of the Tigris and Euphrates, as if they don't understand the difference from the <laughs> the difference between the beginning of something and the end of a river. I share this for <laughs> a couple reasons. Don't say anything. Yeah. First, don't trust religious scholars. They are nincompoop. Well, these are the same people that start at the end of the book. <laughs> That's no, they are the same people that start at the end of the book and then disregard the beginning of the book. Uh, although they claimed that the end of the book was based on the beginning of the book and that the, the oh, God of the end of the book is the God of the end of the book, they discredit and uh, discount because they say that the beginning of the book no longer matters because it was uh, useless and counterproductive, so they needed a God that they could uh, make an <laughs> image, which they, they immediately help. nailed to oh. a stick and touted as a dead God on a stick because who wouldn't want to worship a dead god on a stick. Nonetheless, <laughs> the Garden of Eden and the location of the flood are co-terminus, the latter just east of the former. The mountains of Ararat are located 200 miles east by northeast of the headwaters of the Tigris and are within a stone's throw of the Euphrates headwaters. This area is in eastern Turkey between the Black and Caspian Seas near the border of Iran and Armenia. Identifying the Pishon is a bit more challenging, but having identified the river which flows to the east as the Gihon, uh, to the southwest as the Parar, Euphrates, and to the southeast as the Chikatel, Tigris, symmetry would suggest that we'd be wise to look for one that flows north or northwest of Lake Van. That would be give us some symmetry. God likes symmetry. In this regard, mm -hmm. I think the most likely candidate for the Pichon is the Red River, known today as the uh, uh, Kizil Urmak. Kizil Urmak. K I Z I L I R M A K. This river is a good fit since Yahweh told us that it would be known for its red stones. Well, it's called the Red River. Also, <laughs> yeah, you have to be brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> this stuff. Uh, the, the, also, the original name of what is now Turkey's largest river was the uh, Pasianos, confirming that it is a wolty candidate for the pit shown. Uh, most of all the etymological tools connect uh, ancient names to their modern equivalents by comparing the consonant roots before vocalization and conjugation. The uh, Fasianus and the Pichon 
share the same PSN root. Very good. Okay, so much for so getting any, any credit here, so this was all pretty easy. The Red River source is less than 100 miles west by northwest of Lake Van. Unlike the other three rivers, it flows west and then north before draining into the Black Sea. Neolithic civilizations along the uh, Kizilamak uh, River date back to about 4000 BCE with the Assyrian uh, Phygian and the Hittite colonies emerging around 1900 BCE. The control of this volcanic region passed to the Tubals, to the Persians, and the Greeks under Alexander before falling to the Romans, the Byzantines, the Seljuks, which were the Mongolian Muslims who invaded the Christian capital, forming the Ottoman Empire. Mm -hmm. It was on the Red River's shores that the Turks annihilated over one million Armenian Christians in a genocidal rage and the aftermath of World War I, uh, turning the waters red. I think I may have mentioned it, but I want to mention it again. I, I, uh, I guess it was now two weeks ago that I watched a movie that was brilliantly written, brilliantly filmed. The dialogue was spectacular, cinematography spectacular, um, the costumes uh, uh, spectacular, just beautifully acted. It was called the uh, the promise. It's the worst movie I think I've ever seen. Uh, no, I mean it was a spectacular movie, but it uh, it uh, boy, it'll make you mad. It'll make you mad. Yeah, it's uh, it's the story of what the uh, the Muslim Turks did to the Armenian Christians, and the genocide they perpetrated, and the way they lied about it. It is. Uh, 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 Reading this, I, I, I have to put in a plug for the Armenians and, mm -hmm. and the way they were harassed by the, uh, the Muslims. Uh, David Roll, who is a controversial but insightful and talented antiquity scholar, I, I mean, I want to emphasize, he's a very controversial figure. I, I think David Roll does some good work, uh, by the way, and he is uh, redating the Egyptian timeline and showing the, uh, the Hebrew. Uh, presence in uh, Egypt. His work is brilliant in that regard. Uh, but yeah, you know, he's he, he's he's definitely an interesting and controversial fellow. He speculated that the Pishon is the uh, uh, Uzhan. Its tributaries descend from the volcanic ridges uh, ridges east of Lake uh, Armia, 200 miles southeast of Lake Van, eventually emptying into the Caspian Sea. While there is no initial P sound, the remainder of the name is somewhat similar, and the uh, Uzhan is known uh, as the Kezel Uzan, or Long Gold River, and as such, it fits the Taurus depiction of this waterway meandering through the land of gold. I suppose it is possible that a volcanic eruption in the area truncated the original source, moving it further south. Why Roland and I disagree regarding the Pishon, his work on establishing a valid Egyptian chronology which synchronizes with the, the Torah in a test of time, I think is an essential read for those who love uh, archaeology. Now, putting it all together, both tributaries of the Euphrates and the Tigris, the headwaters of the Kishon uh, and the Red River, the Pishon, emerge within 100 miles of each other, all with Lake Van at the upper center. And as I mentioned earlier, this blue oasis can be found 200 miles south of their easternmost shore of the Black Sea and due west of the Caspian. It is important because it appears to be mankind's uh, oldest civilization that is buried beneath the shores of the Black Sea. And archaeologists are beginning to discover that mankind's first mixed religion and politics in this environment. We will consider what is known about their culture in subsequent uh, chapters. Uh, I've been translating. It is uh, it's heartbreaking to read the words that Yahweh used to describe the religious and political and militant cultures that came uh, to exist. Uh, east of Eden, um, he 
he explained why he had no choice but to clean the house. So before we move on, be aware that Yahweh referred to each of the specific places in which the rivers flowed as coal errands, as the whole land area or region. And yet when he uses this exact same phrase with reference to the flood, somehow the biblical scholars translate it as the whole earth. Yep, the whole Mm -hmm. earth. There's a Hebrew word for whole world, isn't there? uh, Our world, isn't there, Uh, J.B.? Yes. Temple. Temple. So if Yahweh Mm -hmm. wanted to say that the whole world was flooded, he would have used temple. And what's interesting is Eretz, the primary definition of Eretz is ground. Region. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's mm-hmm. earth in the sense of, you know, the, uh, the, in English, we have the same word for earth and the planet. You know, if you reach down and grab a handful of earth, that's also the name for the planet. But, but Eretz is, is earth in the sense of soil. And it means uh, land or region, or area, or territory. And there's a Hebrew word for the, for the planet. It's a temple. So I, I just don't understand why they would uh, do something that horrific when God is specifically identifying and very descriptive of the geography and the culture that he sought to, uh, to cleanse. And one of the things that's truly interesting, too, is that the terms that Yahweh uses to describe what he intended to do, they're all cleansing terms. Wiping, mm-hmm. cleansing, um, sweeping. They're, they're all, he was trying to cleanse away the impurities so that uh, man could live uh, safely without the, uh, the pollution. And there are so many mistranslations, too, as we'll find, with, uh, with him saying that God wanted to wipe out all the animals there. No, he doesn't. He went to great lengths to save the animals. And so it is, um, uh, there's just a lot of misinformation regarding the, uh, the flood. So as we continue to work to eradicate some of the confusion, at least for those willing to closely examine all of the Torah's insights. Uh, this is an, an interesting passage, and we'll end tonight's program on, uh, on it. In, in it, Yahweh reveals something that helps us tie the Shabbat and Sukkah together while explaining the purpose of both. Uh, this reads, and this is Barashi Genesis 2.15. Yahweh... Almighty, so we still have, and we're still in the second chapter, so it's Yahweh, who is God. Uh, relationally, kept, grasp hold of the man named Adam, Ha Adam, and he settled him restfully in the garden, gone, protected, defended, enclosed, in covered place of care and concern for life of Eden. Great joy, delight, pleasure, total satisfaction in the favorable state of great gladness to minister to her, to work it, to labor in her, to serve her and to cultivate it and to closely observe her. Did you ever thought that Adam's purpose was to work in the garden and to observe what was occurring there? No. God gives us a very purpose. I mean, there's, there's two things that are just immensely profound here. The first is that Adam came from someplace else, and he was placed in the garden. Yeah. So God's not saying that Adam was the first man. He just plucked Adam from someplace else, and he brought him into the garden. So that's the antithesis of what the religious say, that, you know, uh, that Adam was the first man. That is not what God's saying. Adam was someplace else. He was plucked out of that someplace else and put into the garden. The second thing is that the purpose of doing that was for Adam to abide. To care. That mm. is to work, to minister, to serve, to labor. 
to cultivate. Cultivate. Wow. Yeah. And to shamar, to be observant. <laughs> Close example. <laughs> to shamar. So God wanted right. someone right. who he could work with, who he could engage with, who he could do stuff with, who wasn't going to be a bump in the walk, who wasn't going to be on welfare and entitlements and, and think that uh, they were owed everything. He wanted someone who was willing to work because he values work. Work builds character. Work creates a sense of purpose. Work creates things that have value. And the, the single most important thing that we can do as people is to be observant. Shamar. To closely examine and carefully consider. I thought that was the second profound insight. And there's the third. Garden, the gan, the Hebrew word, speaks of, of an enclosure that is protected, that is mm-hmm. conducive to life. That's the purpose of the place. God wants to protect and preserve life. He wants to create an environment where life flourishes, but not any kind of life. This place was a five-star resort. Eden had it all. Great joy. It was delightful. It was pleasurable. Total satisfaction. A favorable state of state of Great gladness. This was the place, man. God created a utopian environment. But without any of man's viewpoints, the utopian happiness, satisfaction, pleasure, great luxury are the meanings of it. Man would not just be satisfied, he'd be happy. He wouldn't just be happy. The joy would be enormous, be tremendous pleasures. And there is joy and pleasure, by the way, in work. There are... It's just something to do. Yeah, yeah, ob- observing a beautiful sunrise, a yeah. wonderful waterfall, yeah. uh, uh, laughing at the aardvark and the platypus. A sense of enjoyment, of pleasure. So being observant uh, and working are the things that uh, set this apart. So here you have a statement that has so many profound insights that if you just take the time to say, wow, man already existed. This man, uh, Adam, the man, was taken from one place and placed in the garden. He was settled restfully there, that the garden was a protected environment that was conducive to life and that it was named Eden, which means great joy, uh, tremendous delight, pleasure, satisfaction. And then that his purpose was to administer to her, to work in this garden, to serve with him, to work together, to cultivate life and to be very observant, paying attention, to closely examine and carefully considering. Because isn't that what eternity is going to be as we go off and explore together? I hope so. He wants wow. people who are going to be, be observant, who are going to closely examine and carefully consider what's going to be seen, or what's the purpose of sharing it? No, it's it's like uh, I, you know, I'm living in, in about as close as you could be, particularly if you got rid of the government here and the religious establishments here and the cultural establishments. But just in terms of the normal run-of-the-mill people and the environment, this is pretty close to being a garden of uh, of great joy. When the sun rises, it's so much more enjoyable, satisfying to share the beauty of the sunrise. The same is true with the sunset. The same is true with the end of the day and the long light uh, hits the top of the trees and they just glisten with a special glow. Or when the waves kick up and you have the sand that creates that uh, stunning blue color of uh, the ocean when it's its absolute prettiest. Or you see the clouds that are dancing over the sea. Uh, the waves crashing over the the reef. 
Uh, you walk on the beautiful white sands and put your toe on the water and it's 85 degrees. It's up to 90 in the middle of the uh, of the summer where it's a really cold day if it gets down to 75 at night. And it's really hot here if it gets uh, up into the low 90s. And that's God's idea of... Uh, Quite certain those were the conditions that were experienced in in Eden. Now they didn't need no thinking clothes. I mean, you know, here I put on a pair of shorts and a and a t-shirt, and if I'm really dressing up, I'll put on a pair of flaps. But uh, (laughs) belt? What would you need one of those things for? Long pants? I have got some in the closet, but I don't know why. You know. A long sleeve shirt? Are you kidding? A sweater? Oh, what would that be for? Hard shoes? Socks. Oh, my God. I haven't thought about socks in so long, I can't remember. Yes, such a show off. <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> it's 47 degrees. Yeah. Oh, and it's raining. <laughs> yeah, Jackie told me that because I was, uh, I was complaining that it got a little chilly here the other day. And it did. It, it, uh, like it, was, it was darn cold for us because it, uh, the high for the day was like 82. And I must tell you, it was like, it was like being in a freezer for us. And I was uh, uh, bemoaning the, uh, the drop in temperature. And uh, Jackie said, yeah, it's snowing here. <laughs> you have it worse than me. You yeah. might ought to come down there and paint that place. Yeah, somebody ought to. We ought to get a good painter down here. What a <laughs> find, find somebody knows how to paint. Yeah. yeah. I'll look uh, around. I'll see. We have uh, we have a budding artist. We we uh, Leah's yeah. close friends. Just yeah. a really bright woman that uh, suffered so much under uh, religious parents who were part of a uh, of a cult. Mm-hmm. But but like so many people mm-hmm. who who were treated badly of, uh, in a religious environment. Uh, she's used that to hone her character and has grown out of it, and it's just this amazing purpose. And she has a uh, a twelve year old daughter that is a budding artist. So I can't wait for you to uh, to meet this uh, charming lady. She is um, she is just a uh, a bright, charming, wonderful, warm. Uh, if there ever was a perfect kid, I think this is the perfect kid. But she, whether it's sculpture or uh, or painting or drawing, tremendous mm-hmm. talent. So she could use a, a good art teacher. Um, and so yes, there's there's. Uh, uh, I'm not sure the compensation is very good around here, but uh, the, the the perks the perks are uh, okay. The environment are, makes it worth it. <laughs> the, the environment and the people are uh, are truly uh, are truly amazing. It's, yeah. uh, it's a wonderful place. Yeah. So anyway, that, we'll return to this statement uh, this time uh, next week. Uh, sorry to go get all personal with you on uh, on our friends and uh, and, <laughs> and our wardrobe, but but you know when I read that uh, this was the what God created and the intent of it all to be observant and to work together uh, in a place that that brings smiles. It's uh, hard not to say, you know, I'm experiencing some of that. And, uh, you know, I think that that's Yahweh's intent as well. If you um, choose to work with him, you choose to observe what he has offered us, you you choose to, to live with him in and uh, in Eden, um, he's going to reward that. That's what he wants. He wants us happy. He wants uh, our lives to flourish. He wants us to be observant. He wants us to be productive uh, in what we do. Um, so th- there's really nothing that has changed in all of this time. It is still Yahweh's desire. So with that said, uh, fellas, happy uh, Shabbat. Uh, to all, I, yeah, hope you survive. I understand that they're trying to lock things down again in Texas, but the, somebody in the uh, in the court system in Texas was smart enough the other day to say, "Nope, you can't do that." That <laughs> is really? un- move to California. Yeah, so uh, so we have 
at least one judge in Texas who uh, who gets it. That's uh, that part's encouraging. And yeah. um, and so I, I wish you uh, all the best, and we look forward to uh, being together again, and we can get out of the world of uh, of man and into the Word of God and, yeah. and enjoy everything yeah. that He has to offer. Uh, happy Shabbat, and may Yah bless you all. Thank, thank you, thank you, gentlemen. Good night. Good night. Good night.